This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. Welcome to the first episode of the new school year. Yeah. In which I immediately get sick. <laughs> <laughs> and now I sound like this. And now I sound like this. Got yep. my back to school cold out Your of the back way. Back to school cold. Just checked it off in week one. It's a a yearly tradition. Uh-huh. A beloved Every yearly year, tradition. I get sick as soon as we go back. Never mm-hmm. fails. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My allergies have been very, very bad too. I think you're getting a double whammy of a cold and allergies. Yeah, I agree. I think yeah. it. I think it's definitely a, a double issue here for yeah. me. Yep. So, um, doing okay, doing everything I should. Yeah. So, what about you? What's your? Uh, what's it like? Oh, I'm just you know. In also dealing with allergies. Something. Very bad allergies. Yeah, last couple of days it's been pretty gross. Yeah, back in no the swing just of things. Back in the normal swing of you know, no more summer vacation mode. Yeah, back into day job, day job crunch mode. You know. Yeah, you're back in the in the thick of it. Into the thick of it. Dab, dab, dab. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Pretty boring. Just lots and lots of work. Yeah. And podcasting. As it turns out, yeah. As it turns out kind of a thing we do yeah it is every two weeks we've been doing it for a long time now yeah for us i I wasn't sure how long this experiment would last but here we still are puttering along is it still an experiment this far in i I, no i guess not i guess i just didn't know when it came just like you know a real real deal it's a it's a grown-up a grown-up a grown-up podcast (laughs) well we're not much in the way of exciting i'm afraid Yes, you're right. We are not very exciting. Although we did have one exciting thing come out of the last episode that we did, which I just wanted to shout out really quick. Oh, um, yeah. My grandma, I think, is our number one fan. Yeah. She she listens very religiously yes. to the podcast. and uh, Even more religiously than we do. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. She'll email us and be like responding to things. And I'm like, oh, God, yeah, we said that. Didn't yeah. We? And I'm quickly reminded that like, oh, no, people, people actually listen. People actually do listen uh-huh. to this thing. But yeah, yeah, she... Uh, she listened to our Clear the List episode and then sent you in some money to help you get some yeah. books for your classroom. I'm so excited. I thought that was extremely adorable. So yeah. thank you, Gramsci. Very, very for sweet. For your support. Thank you. You specifically are the hero of the week for the podcast. Yes, this, so. yes you are. I got, I think like eight books That's for great. my classroom. That's great. I'm really excited, yeah. So thank you. And thank yes, you all. thank you. And uh, don't forget to send us in your uh, your Clear the List links if you've got any. I don't, I don't. I know that we've gotten any yet, but if you've got clear the list things on Amazon or something like that, just let us know and we'll promote you on our social media. Don't forget, that's still ongoing. So yeah, always a bit of house. Teachers always need to buy stuff. So. Yep, yep. All right. Well, you want to crack right into it? Yeah. I feel like I have to immediately tone myself down. Yeah, we're talking about we're tackling a very serious one that we've had on our list since the beginning. It's probably one of the first things we came up with. Yeah, we were like, we have to talk about this, but we haven't wanted to because it's a very difficult topic. So we've just been putting it off for more than a year and a half now, I think. So this is something we've had on the list since the very beginning. It's been something that I've actively avoided a bunch. Yeah, we've not talked. So we're talking about school shootings and we've specifically not talked about it because it is... Horrible. So heavy a topic that it's <laughs> difficult to work up the energy to do research on it. And even today when I was researching it, I was just like, this does not make me feel good. Yeah, you messaged me and you were like, my chest is tight. Yeah, <laughs> this was giving me anxiety yeah. to even read yeah. about and research for this topic. So, I mean, we're not going to go into a huge in-depth thing on it because as perhaps many of our listeners know, gun violence epidemic in this country is an ongoing, real, and serious thing that yeah. permeates every aspect of our lives, I, I suppose. So it's uh, it's kind of omnipresent. We're being crushed by it continuously. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we wanted to talk about it not in the context of some recent, very recent event, like the, which is not to say that there aren't shootings right. that happening all the time, but we kind of wanted to talk about these things but not at a time when it was very much in the discourse. And yeah. that's just because well, we you didn't want to like, we didn't want to get uh, something out of it being right. an anniversary. Yeah. yeah. We didn't want to feel like we were capitalizing on yeah. some tragic event. So we're talking about it kind of now when we're not in the midst of a news cycle about 
a school shooting. But that, again, that's not to say that they aren't happening somewhat frequently in a less, unfortunately, uh, like less media spotlight kind of way, but they are ongoing all the time. So we're going to tackle it. We're going to talk about it. You know, as we're going back in session, schools are going back in session from summer breaks everywhere. We're seeing students once again, having to do lockdown drills and it's yeah. kind of on our minds, right. you know, it's on well, and like the legislative, year, ad- legislative agenda. It's trying to be in those kinds of discussions. So, you know, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, go ahead. Last year we didn't do active drills with the students we just mm-hmm. like talked through them basically because of covid yeah. yeah unless we evacuated the evacuation ones we could do obviously but the actual lockdown stayed in place we did not do so this year that was like day three we got mm-hmm. into those so mm-hmm. unfortunately these practices are back and not like they ever left but yes right yeah we live in a time and in a country where students have to practice what to do in the event yeah that they get shot at while they're trying to learn. It was really weird because leading up to COVID, before we were sent home for the original COVID, right, March of 2020, I used to have, like, horrible dreams about these types of things. Yeah. It wasn't always a school shooting. It was just some sort of horrible, you know what I mean? Like, we've had bomb scares, we've had whatever. And as soon as COVID hit, I stopped having them. <laughs> It's well, I think so... your brain might have been distracted by another. That's true. Uh, I would anxiety. probably, yeah, that's true. My anxiety just got displaced, but yeah, it's, it's swap one out um, for another. Yeah, well, I mean, what do I even choose? You know, if I had to pick, but yeah. I always thought that was really interesting because I was like, wow, I'm sleeping better, and it's probably because I'm not dreaming about these horrible things. Yeah, and so there's a pandemic trying to kill me. Anyways, yeah. So unfortunately, there is a bit of a long history to these events. <sighs> in the united states a lot states. longer than i thought yeah you, you you think of these things as a somewhat recent phenomenon and they are not so the earliest example that i think we both found when we were doing there's an overlap between mass shootings and just regular non-mass whatever it gets considered i think it's like four more people i don't know where the cutoff is for mass shootings these days but there's like a number that i think it's four more i think i thought shooting. it was four more yeah. i don't know why i know I that I'm isn't it sad positive. that i kind of just know that no off the top of i actually mind. read that i'm pretty sure the fbi labeled it as four yeah four so anyway our law enforcement agencies have like a cutoff for what constitutes a mass shooting or not but anyway shootings in schools have been happening for as long as well actually before the united states was even a country (laughs) so the earliest example that we had that we found goes as 1764 i think it was Uh near present day greencastle pennsylvania i think there's some sort of argument students got into and it just ended up with people yeah it was like yeah it like had started the day before yeah and they came back in the next day yeah Um, yeah and that's when it, it occurred Yep, but just some sort of general commentary on on these things, statistically speaking and historically speaking, and people who commit gun violence on school grounds, uh, active shooters that we're talking about, they they very often have a connection to the school. You know, they're like a student or a former student or a former teacher. We've seen like, you know, disgruntled ex-employees. They usually have a connection to the school or somebody in the school. Yes, parent, Um, like a parent or... Mm-hmm. A lot of times you'll hear about like custody disputes yep. and issues like that will pop up. Domestic ex- disputes spilling over into the school environment. With that connection, it's also the case that guns that are used in school-based violence generally come from the shooter's home or the homes of family or friends. Shooters often exhibit warning signs of potential violence that concern those around them. There are usually, you know, red flags happening or noticeable changes in behavior or things like yeah. that. And like some of the other issues in the American school system that we've talked about, gun violence in American schools has a disproportionate impact on students of color. One note about this, so this is kind of along the lines of what I was just talking about, mass shootings on school grounds, some of the examples we're about to talk about, like Sandy Hook, like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, these mass shootings are not commonplace, even though they loom enormously large in our kind of media and our, you know, our public consciousness. They, they represent mass shootings that represent less than 1% of overall school gun violence incidents, but they have a disproportionate share of overall deaths and people wounded from school gun violence. Yeah. So again, we are all probably incapable of escaping these examples that we're about to talk about, but this is just to kind of get touch on some of the big ones that have impacted 
our lives. The very first one, we weren't alive for this one, but our parents, I remember my parents at least talking about this one. I don't know if you remember this, but it's the... I have read about this one, but I have not yeah, anything other than that. The University of Texas Tower shooting is what it's known as. It happened August 1st, 1966. There were 18 deaths in this school shooting. It's a 25-year-old engineering student, he was a former U.S. Marine, got onto the clock tower at the University of Texas, Austin. Jeez. Killed three people inside the tower and then started firing from the observation deck, killing a further 12 people and wounding 31 others during a 96-minute oh, shooting rampage. Yeah. He was shot and killed by police. Jeez. So he'd murdered his wife and mother at their homes. That's kind of like this example of domestic issues spilling over onto yeah. school grounds. It was the deadliest shooting at a college campus until 2007 oh which we're also going to talk about that's virginia tech it was also the deadliest american mass shooting altogether for nearly 18 years Jeez. next one is columbine this one columbine high school shooting that happened on april 20th 1999 there were 15 deaths this one absolutely defined our childhood yeah. experience of school I this, this is what i before this i don't think i remember even the thought of something like a no. lockdown drill Lockdown no. drills started happening, becoming commonplace in American schools after Columbine. Yeah. And I was like on the young side. I was like, whatever. And I guess I was 10. I, like, I did not really get it. I really yeah. just did not. I did not understand what was happening. I knew it was very upsetting. I remember seeing the kids who did this on the news. I remember talking with my parents about it, but I just kind of was too young at the time to realize what was really going on and how yeah. much of a, yeah, th that event was like, in my mind, that kicks off the whole idea of building up an incredible media spectacle around it. mass shootings. Mm -hmm. Again, the fact that these things takes place take place in schools, it pr puts a particular focus on them. They're like very, it's it's very hard to escape the impact of the media narratives around these events. I guess is what I would just say. Yeah, I was gonna say like I remember like when I think about my childhood and like remembering seeing things on TV. It's like Columbine in my parents' bedroom on like the Today Show coverage. Yeah. I remember, like, Princess Diana. You know what I mean? Like, there are, like, certain things that I remember seeing on the news repeatedly. Yeah. And, like, this one definitely sticks out to me. Yep. In terms of a 24-hour news cycle, this was definitely a, a big yep. one from when we were pretty young. They killed two students in the schoolyard. They fatally wounded a teacher in the hallway. And then they killed the rest of their victims in the school library. They started fires and engaged in gunfights with police. They I didn't remember the part about the fires. To, yeah. I remember that they had rec like they had made kind of like home video type things of themselves doing yeah. target practice and yep. planning out Talking these attacks. Yep. So anyway, that was that was Columbine. Next one here, Virginia Tech. Remember this one much more, much more because it was like right at the end of my high school, you know, time of my high school. That was April 16th to 2007. There were 32 deaths and the, Virginia Tech is still the third. It's ranked the third deadliest U.S. mass shooting, not even at schools, but Gosh. ever behind 2017, the Route 91 Harvest Festival shooting yeah. in Las Vegas and 2016's Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. So Ugh. it's still ranked third deadliest mass shooting behind those two events. That was one in which a 23-year-old student killed 32 students and faculty members in two separate attacks on the campus of Virginia Tech and then committed suicide. I remember this one because I had, you know, I knew some people who were kind of in that area at that point. So. Yeah, I knew someone who was at Virginia Tech when it happened. Yep. This one is when I talk about a little bit later, like our Alice training. This is one that kind of shook up a lot of what the response was. Virginia to, Tech. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because these people sheltered in place. Yep. And they were just sitting ducks in rooms. I remember that the, the, the campus wide and like security response to this one did come under criticism at the time because they were, people were kind of unprepared and they didn't know they couldn't. I remember not being able to locate the shooter for a while. I remember that Ugh. they put the whole campus in lockdown. Yep. So I remember that like, like we were talking about post Columbine lockdown drills were a very big deal, but at least when I was, you know, growing up and in school beyond lockdown sort of which just meant turning off the lights locking the door and sheltering in place that's what that did, was yeah. the only part of a plan for dealing with school shooters that i remember rehearsing sort of during my school years growing up yeah so now we've got we'll talk about it later but your drills now are much more logistically involved yes. i Jeez, think yes um and a lot of that comes Their from plan yep like you're saying a lot of that i think comes out of a response yeah. to the virginia tech shootings next we have sandy hook this one is particularly heartbreaking just because it was so many extremely young kids who were killed this happened december 14th 2012 in newtown connecticut 
or 28 deaths, and it's the fourth deadliest U.S. mass shooting behind Virginia Tech. That's when a 20-year-old killed 27 people and himself. He first killed his mother at their shared home before taking her guns and driving to his former elementary school. He brought four guns with him, killed 20 first-grade children, ages 6 and 7, along with six adults, including four teachers, the principal, and the school psychologist. He killed himself as police arrived. This is so hard to read all this. And then this one, next one is of Parkland shootings at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. This happened February 14th, 2018. There were 17 deaths. 19-year-old former student whose behavior had led to his expulsion began shooting students and staff members with a semi-automatic rifle at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School after activating a fire alarm. So he caused panic by pulling this a fire is, alarm and then... Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about the moving parts, this is worse. I mean just the chaos of a fire alarm and then all like i can't imagine and like we practice these types of things because of this and it's just horrible yeah out of this particular event came the i would say now pretty famous march for our lives which was a protest at first it was the largest single day of protest against gun violence in history in the united states uh, the march for our lives and now there's an organization that's been codified around that event and it's, you know, students from Parkland were organizing it, essentially, and they led this protest, and then they kind of took off a tour on a tour across the country. And they registered 50,000 new voters. Their mission was to end the gun violence epidemic in this country. So, yeah, Ugh. that's the rundown. That's Again, these are just some of the big ones in recent history and again some of these rank among the deadliest mass shootings in this country which as we are all pretty familiar with at this point is a regular occurrence Mm -hmm. in the united states so anyway how do we address these what have we done to prevent them i Uh. the answer about what we have done to prevent them is pretty much nothing i mean in this country the gun lobby is a very powerful political force and people enjoy having firearms and it feels i would say kind of defeating to to even think about having conversations about how to mitigate gun violence it's just it's very it's very difficult i i mean i enjoy having personal freedoms too so okay but uh, we are uniquely bad Mm -hmm. as a country at confronting this problem where i would say peer countries have figured out how not to have a huge gun violence epidemic. Yes. I was just reading some statistics from a couple of different organizations. We'll put them in the show notes, but one of them was called Every Town Research. I thought this was interesting. There, So a lot of these stats come from them. But one of them was that one in three mass shooters are legally prohibited from possessing firearms at the time when they carry out their shootings. So <laughs> a third of shootings, people are not legally allowed to have the firearms yeah. that they carry out the shootings with so if that goes to tell you anything about just the the prevalence of guns and particularly automatic and semi-automatic weapons that's uh i, I yeah. i'll just leave it to you all to decide what that means but a third of people are legally prohibited from possessing the firearms at the time of the shootings that they carry out so woof the things that we have done in this country have been much more like a... It seems on a policy level that we simply have admitted that people are going to have weapons and that our the best thing we could do is try to respond to that fact. So we've done things like install metal detectors in schools, yeah. active shooter drills. We've, we've invested more money in school resource officers. In some cases, people have tried to arm teachers, which statistically speaking actually makes classrooms more unsafe. Yeah. Uh, uh, so those have been responses um, at a sort of national political and policy level. I have a note in here about this one scene from the West Wing where they're talking about yeah we're talking this. about gun violence and the, the the one it's one guy who's a Democrat. He should be on the the White House's side of this issue, but he votes against this gun control bill. And he basically does it because he's like, well, okay, you banned this one kind of stock, but not this other one. You've got to ban this kind of ammunition, but not this other one. You've done all this stuff that is sort of like lip service to solving a gun violence problem, but you're not actually solving Doing a gun violence about problem. It, yeah. So that's kind of like opening the door for other. Pretty much whatever. been in that same cycle of doing little things here and there to try to fix some of these problems, but we're just not there as a country. We've just kind of are like, we don't know. We don't know what to do. 
So that was a lot of talking on my part. I, if you, I would like to not be the one talking exclusively now. No, I wasn't so, trying to make it just no, no, no. Talking. I just went on it's like a very brief history of very dark things in our country. So, you did. would you like to talk a little bit about what you, sure, as a sure. real teacher, <laughs> have had to ah, sort of absorb? It's me, the real teacher here. Yeah, what you've had to absorb about this, what you've had to, you know, yeah. become accustomed to. Tell us, tell us what it's like. So it started in my undergrad, and that was the first place that I learned ALICE, which is what's still practiced today. And so ALICE stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. So these are like the steps for a response. Mm-hmm. The it's, acronym, which is a little weird because it's just some girl's name, but yes. Yeah, so we have ALICE drills. So it started in my undergrad, like I said. Is that like a like across the country they know it as that? It it's is. not just yeah. Like a, it's it's a special training that yeah school resource officers can go and get and gotcha. that admins and people like that can go and receive as well to be Alice certified. But it's actually it's really it's pretty common sense when you think about if we've learned that we don't want to be sitting ducks. You know and I mean like it, it's a pretty obvious response to not just sitting in a corner in a dark room all huddled together Mm -hmm. like i said that was when so post columbine that was pretty much what we did yes that i remember doing when i was a student y'all got in the corner yeah you got down you just turned off the lights lights, lock the door it's like oh and you hope that they didn't shoot out the door and open it the thing that always bothered me about that was is just like if i'm a student in this school which is statistically likely to be i'm going to know what people are going to be doing during their lockdown drills so i don't know it's always been a little weird to me but yeah anyway all right Sorry, so Alice. when I went to my student teaching in the fall of 2012, it was the same thing. They were using it. So I got that kind of experience in like real time with students. And then my very first day of subbing. So after I finished my student teaching, I subbed for the rest of the year because mm-hmm. uh, I did a kind of a different schedule. But I started subbing in December. My very first day of subbing was the day that Sandy Hook happened. Jeez. And I was in a third grade classroom. And we were outside with the kids. That probably explains why you have had the nightmares that you have had. Uh-huh about school shootings your very first day yeah and so i remember standing out we were outside all the third grade teachers it was like a i can't remember if it was a friday or not i want to say it was but i could be wrong but i remember we were all standing out there and the principal comes out and starts like waving her arms telling us all to come in as quickly as possible and all these parents were showing up to pick up their kids and take them home like just the fear of it you know but i remember being like what does it say about this career that I've just started where the very first day is one of the most deadly yeah. school shootings and it's about elementary students? Yeah. Anyways, so been at my district for nine years. We've always used Alice. We recently, in the past few years, got our own school resource officer. We share him amongst our district. So all the buildings gets a little bit of him. Since I've been there, we have done everything from like one or two hour trainings with him to a whole day of active shooter training where they brought in guns and used like dead rounds and are you getting a shot of paintball guns or something they were like like, nerf guns but like with those little yellow ones that like shoot like it's not like the dart it's like a ball that they shoot out of those things Mm -hmm. those things hurt yeah let me tell you yeah and they like uh we were on the top floor of the school and so we had to like decide what to do based on the, the information we were given and so like a bunch of us decided we were going to try to evacuate and uh as soon as we turned out of the corner we just got all pelted in the back with like this it wow. hurt it was really upsetting because something i'd never thought about before that that day of training was like how loud gunshots are i lived in the country my whole life grew up you know what i mean like i know what it sounds like we hear sure. them but they said that in doing this training one of the things they realized is that it is so loud in a school if you think about like the linoleum floor and the yeah. metal of the lockers lots of surfaces and to sound the concrete bounce off walls of. uh-huh. like when those go off it paralyzes you because mm-hmm. it is so loud and it happened and i seriously it, i couldn't believe how loud it was mm-hmm. and it actually i was like i don't think i could have made a decision if that was happening at random and i had to make choices i, I don't know how my brain would have ever yeah. done it mm-hmm. it's so loud mm-hmm. so it's probably good that i've heard it i guess because maybe that would help me but um that day really really taught me a lot i mean we were learning all of the options like we learned how to pack bullet holes that day like with our first aid kits we were taught how to do tourniquets all these different types of things we are some well-prepared teachers let me tell you are you a teacher or are you a field medic it was a wild day we've only done that once though so it's not a very common full day thing but we normally do at least you know an update every year Mm -hmm. in pd so what did like when you do an alice drill what does that actually look like what is the process for that the drills 
Uh, there's multiple kinds. Sometimes they will tell us the scenario before. Sometimes it'll be a surprise. Mm-hmm. So we have to decide what to do. Mm-hmm. In all of our classrooms, we have a bucket that was donated. And uh, in the bucket is a bunch of stuff that we think could help us. And so in the case of my school as well, a couple years ago, they put in these, uh, they bracketed these clips to the wall and we have a wire that could go around our doorknobs and Mm -hmm. wrap back around Mm -hmm. and reattach itself. So that way, if they were able to, if the door was unlocked for some reason, which they're not, this could prevent someone from opening it from Mm -hmm. the outside. The ultimate goal of Alice is to get out. Like Mm -hmm. they want you to leave the building. It's like safer to not be in there, obviously, for a bunch of reasons. But that isn't always the case. But we try to really focus on, okay, as soon as you think you can get out, that's when you make a run for Mm -hmm. it. So most of our drills look something like first week of school. I've already gone over with every class, like kind of what our drill is, like what my room does, where I'm situated, how these things work what's in my bucket, all that kind of Closest stuff. exits to you. Yeah, like I've already kind of run through it. And like I'm a ground floor classroom so we could go out the window, you know, that kind of thing. Usually it starts with us wrapping the cord around the door. If we barricade, we'll start moving chairs and tables and things like that to block the window. And then from there, we try to all space out as much as possible so we're not in a group. And I try to arm the kids with something, every single one of them. Jeez. If it's a Chromebook, if it's a textbook, if it's a softball, if it's a can of beans, hammer, wasp spray you know any of this stuff being an english teacher kind of serves me well though because i got a lot of big books i can check and if if you had a book flying at your head you're gonna think about it whatever you're doing it's gonna make you think but ultimately like i said the the biggest goal for us is still just to get out Mm -hmm. um we go over with the students what happens if the shooter is in our room and we take him down and get the gun away from him so we talk about what we do with the gun like we don't pick it up we don't turn it on him to threaten him We flip a trash can on top of it. We sit on top of the trash can and people hold us down so that if a cop comes in or whoever's helping us comes in, they know, you know, that we're not the ones causing the trouble. Mm -hmm. So I will say that I don't feel lucky to teach high schoolers in this case, but I feel lucky to teach high schoolers in this case because I've got a bunch of little adults and some of them are much larger than I am and much stronger than I am. I cannot imagine what it would feel like with a bunch of little ones. I can't even fathom it. Because I get scared for my kids and they're 16. Right. So it's, uh, there, there is a moment where I'm like, okay, you got a bunch of big kids in here. We could, we could do some damage. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Our school runs us through probably two or three in the first semester. Same thing in the second. Sometimes we'll just talk about what we would do. And then we also have done a, a whole Alice drill for each lunch. Because the common hour is like what happened at Columbine are actually some of the scariest options. Right. Just because of the chaos of it. So we have done, like, everyone's at lunch, we get everybody out, come back in. Like, we've tried to cover, you know, as many options as possible. I mean, you can't prepare for them all, obviously, but that's kind of what we've done Mm -hmm. to at least prepare for some of them. So, anyways, I mean, the schools have built in a lot of things, a lot of safety measures. What we know of them, the kids don't know, obviously, just because they're, statistically speaking, is more likely to be one of them. You know what I mean? So they don't know everything that we do about some of our built-in safety features, but Mm -hmm. schools do Mm -hmm. go to great lengths to try to prep the teachers as best they can. Right. Um, the other thing I would say about it is that these kids have been doing this for so long that it's second nature to them, which is a blessing and a curse. That's uh, super disturbing to me. It is. I just... But, like, I, I think one of the worst parts about this is that we're taught that once we enter lockdown, we don't let anybody in. It doesn't matter what they're saying to you. It doesn't matter who they are. You do not open that door. And so, like, that's one of, like... Every time I think about that, like, it chokes me up, like, to think about. And I, like... Even when I'm going through this whole thing with my students, I tell them, like, if it's me, you can't open it. Like, you lock me out. Like, I will find my... You know, like... But that's part of it. Anytime these, like, shootings... Like, when Parkland happened, I remember, like, it was early in the morning, and we're in the same time zone as them, so it was, like, happening in real time for us. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, kids just sat there just, like, white, you know? Like... They just couldn't... I mean, that was probably their Columbine, as far as I can right. really think. Right. And they want to talk about it, and they and they want to feel secure, and they want to know that you know what you're doing. And I'd have to say that if every school treats something like this as seriously as my school does, I feel pretty confident that I could take care of us, you know? Like, I really do. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but it, it's kind of, like reassuring to me to know that I know so many things about it. I don't know. I feel like that's probably the only way you could get through it is just the the gut reaction of knowing what to do. Yeah. But 
So those are just some of the things that we do. Like I said, schools have a lot of built-in security features that kids don't know about. And there are like rally points around the school and like our community knows about them. And so it's a whole invasive thing, you know, like Mm -hmm. we have brought in local SWAT teams and things like that to practice. I've seen, you know, multiple trucks, multiple squads, multiple police come screaming through as part of the practice, you know, like, and we've got a button in our office that if we hit the red button, it immediately dispatches a warning to everyone within like, I think it's like 20 some miles Mm -hmm. and every car basically that could receive it does. And they all come there. We're doing our best. Yeah. doesn't mean we want to find out how it works, but we're Mm -hmm. doing our best. So what can we do? Yeah. This is where I start to get a little frustrated because I mean, I've heard people say this specifically of Sandy Hook. I've heard people say that, okay, we might've been paying lip service to the idea that we could do something about gun violence in this country. But when, when we when when Sandy Hook happened and we decided not to really do that was much from a high level policy level about it that that pretty much convinced people that were something of a lost cause and I mean I never think that there's there's no such thing as a totally lost cause but I personally have a lot of kind of anxiety about how to deal with this in this country because it seems like there's a lot of momentum I, I think that it's really inspiring to me to see the Parkland kids mm. doing organizing around this because I think it's going to take that's where it a huge generational yeah. shift and this generation that's coming up you know young voters they're the ones who have had to spend their entire childhood going through active shooter drills yeah so right. like we we did the occasional one in response to Columbine but but they are the ones who have experience the terror of it on a semi regular yeah. basis mm. so so we do have um, some options yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, aside from voting for change and supporting people who support reasonable gun measures, there's groups like Moms Demand Action, which are really involved with this. The Sandy Hook Promise, obviously, is a big mm-hmm. one. March for Our Lives. If if there's a must-read book for a teacher, it would have to be Sue Klebold's book, and it's called A Mother's Reckoning. She's a mother of one of the two Columbine shooters, Columbine shooters yeah. one of them. And we've intentionally not said anybody's name so far, but... Her book is worth mentioning from the standpoint of compassion for a mother who didn't see it coming and for the struggles of mental illness and concerns of suicide and things like that. Her TED Talk is also incredible. I show it to my kids every year. It is humbling and just gut-wrenching. And and I would say, as a teacher, I have been forced to watch and re-watch the CCTV footage of Columbine repeatedly with the sound, without the sound going through the timestamps to say, okay, this is what was happening. You know, like, like Columbine is something that I would say probably every teacher has had to study in a way that they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Um, It's one of the school shootings I'm most familiar with because it's something that has been reenacted to learn about what the response was. And so reading Klebold's book is just, it's just, it just kills you to read. I mean, really, like it, it just hurts. And so I would really, if you're a parent, if you're, a teacher, if you're involved in a school, I would I would definitely read Sue Klebold's book, uh, A Mother's Reckoning. And we'll include a link to her website as well. She goes around and does talks and things like that. And so that's kind of what she's turned her grief into. There's some kind of high-level policy things. That, again, this is from that Everytown research. They do work in this stuff and gun violence and specifically gun violence schools they've done they've done a lot so they have some concrete suggestions for what we as a country should be doing to prevent gun violence like this and these are recommendations that they have codified into a kind of plan and those are to first of all pass extreme risk laws we've probably heard of some of these but it allows family members and law enforcement to act on warning signs of violence and temporarily prevent access to firearms for people who are going through psychological events and maybe threatening self-harm all kinds of different stuff it's basically called an extreme risk law it allows law enforcement to temporarily take firearms from people who are going through those kinds of events we need to pass secure firearm storage laws Primary source of guns used in school gun violence are from the shooter's homes or yep. homes of family or friends, like we mentioned. They're and not secure. Yeah, they are. they're not secured a lot of times. Uh, I think it was like one of the statistics was like half. It was like 52 to 48 percent. And I can't remember which one it was, but it was like basically guns being secured or not secured. Yeah. So it's like, you know, a very large percentage well, of guns are not secured. And I mean, probably once a month that I see in the greater Columbus news area that some small child has accidentally killed themselves or a sibling or a parent because of improper storage and handling. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. They also suggest raising the age to purchase semiotic firearms to 21. Kind of wild to me that it isn't. 
We need to require background checks on all gun sales so that minors and people with problematic histories can't evade gun laws. So right now we have a big thing in this country is that's always in the news. It seems like it's called the gun, the gun show loophole, which some states have mitigated this, but many haven't. It basically says that the idea is that you have to run a background check if somebody is trying to buy a gun, unless you're a private seller, or I think the law says something like doesn't your main source of income or the way you make a living isn't selling guns. If you fit in that category, you oh. don't have to require a background check specifically. Nice. Yeah, like gun shows is where this happens a lot because private people will come and sell their they want to buy guns the and you day. don't have to run a, yeah, they just buy it the same day yeah. and walk out with it. A lot of states have passed laws to prevent that kind of thing, but many haven't. And I don't, I think Ohio, I, I think we still participate. I mean, people still exploit the gun show loophole yeah. here in Ohio, yeah, I think. For sure. So then they also recommend doing things like evidence-based threat assessment programs in schools to identify, assess threats to plan for them, but also to identify students who may be in crisis, assess ri- those risks, appropriately intervene without overly relying on discipline or the criminal justice system but by expanding access to mental health services this is a big one we talked about this i mean it's a little unfortunate to overlap here but we saw the same kind of problem come out of the school to prison pipeline episode we've invested very very heavily in law enforcement and the criminal justice system's presence in schools but other interventions specifically around mental health could and should make a much bigger difference in the lives of people who are prone to all of these kinds of problems. So those kinds of interventions are often what is needed and they're often not what is invested in. And the one thing that is statistically true is that these people, and I'm going to say men because statistically speaking, it's more likely to be the case, but there are usually warnings ahead of time that people can see. Right. Right. Or that they tell a friend, Hey, don't come to school or they have a list or I mean, there are going to be signs. Um, in the case of a lot of them, if they think that, I mean, many school shooters going into it believing that they will die, right? Because mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. that's usually how they end, um, either because they have killed themselves or because they have been killed. So they might start going through kind of the signs of suicide, giving away things, or you and I mean, like there, there are a lot of levels of this. And so we have to encourage our students to be open and honest with us. We have to encourage teachers to know what these signs are like right now. One of our big things that we spent part of our professional development time was doing trauma and informed learn. You know what I mean? Like learning about what that can do. And so I, th- I think that there are moves being made, yeah. but the the key really is for students to feel comfortable and safe. Right. And so a lot of times they might not want to do that because it's their friend. But a lot of most of the times these friends are going to tell them, "Hey, don't come to school this day." Yeah. So yeah, uh, we have to encourage students to speak out. And literally, if you see something, say something, that phrase is so ridiculous, I know, but it's true. So I mean, that's basically the rest of those recommendations. It was it was around that. It was around, you know, trauma-informed approaches to drills or to counseling, you know, establishing safe and equitable yep. schools that all help, you know, the, all of these things help reduce gun violence, uh, especially in high-risk communities. And then just the last note was that the evidence suggests that arming teachers is just like we said earlier Mm. research all shows that allowing teachers to carry guns in schools increases everyday risks to students personally i can't imagine i just i can't imagine being asked to like in my everyday job it's like oh yeah just take a gun to protect yourself i can't imagine no being asked to do that i i don't i'm not you know i'm not anywhere near law enforcement or like military adjacent or anything i specifically chose a career where i wouldn't have to shoot people so like the idea of being asked to yeah potentially shoot people is just kind of mind-boggling to me so anyway the statistics show that that's not the smartest way to protect people anyway go figure yeah this was a really hot topic for my school for a brief bit oh god and i remember talking about this with my students and a lot of students their approach was that they would feel safer if we had them and i looked at them and i said i could never yeah trust me you don't want me well and i you know have a gun and i think (laughs) what is lost in all of these conversations aside from me never trusting myself to shoot something properly that's the thing i'm like i just i'm just i would just be bad at it i'd be scared i'd be panicking i I don't really know how to operate firearms i mean i guess what i'm about to say though is that no amount of training no amount of any of it i couldn't turn it on one of my kids yeah like i yeah, I couldn't. That's the other, yep. there, I'm not built for that. If I had been wired differently, I probably would have sought out that that's, career. That's, that's what that that conversation completely ignores that fact. That's what we're asking you to do. I can we, never. It's like, oh, let's arm our teachers. What? What? Okay, that's a that's a. You know who I'm statistically glossing. most likely to shoot? 
to, as a response, it's going to have to be one of my own. Yeah. I yep. can't. So that's, I, I will beg and plead. I would do anything. But if you're telling me that I had to, I mean, honestly, there was a moment where I thought that they might require it. And I was like, I'm going to have to leave. Well, that's what like, I, I It would have forced me out of the field because I, I couldn't. But just to be absolutely clear, that's what they are asking you to do. When, when people talk about, oh, let's just arm teachers. Like, okay, what you're actually asking to do there is you're asking a teacher to take, to be willing to shoot his or her own students. So, yeah. so it's a nice a way of measure. saying it. It's a quote unquote nicer way of saying it. Like, oh, let's arm teachers. It's like, okay. Well, it's, an arm, it's a response let's, of safety. Let's but yeah. ask people who care about these kids enough to go into the teaching profession to turn a gun on them. I That's what we're asking people to do in response to school shooting. So, And you know what? Maybe my fight or flight would kick in and I would say, okay, I'm going to save myself and this is how. I don't know. I, I can't imagine it would. I'm, like, sad about everything, so I, I don't really think I have it in me to, like, do that. Well, like, I, I, you, like, like, I would hope that I would find a way to survive, right? Like, I, I want to be a fighter. Sure. Um, I don't think I could. But we're also asking you to, for, for example, screw up the rest of your psychological life for right, all time. That too. So, so we treat this thing like a simple, like, oh, yeah, just apply more guns to the problem. But, but we're really asking people to do some incredibly it's just impossible yeah. i no, just i just impossible if that's you that's fine i i hope that my survival instincts my lizard brain would take over yeah and that i would have that nerve but to think about it i'm like i'll just lay down the gun and i'll just stand here and beg you and i will you know i couldn't so yeah anyways well, this is sufficiently depressing. Yeah, we sufficiently <clears throat> depressed ourselves. So thank you for sticking with us. Very difficult topic. We made it through. Now we never have to do this episode again. That's true. It is over now. But the but the reason for this episode will probably continue until we as a country put enough pressure on our government, on our peers, on our friends yeah. to address this well, epidemic. And like, you know, if you're a parent or if you're whatever, raising a, a student, a lot of the things that, you know, we're teaching these kids are things that can be used in home as well to, you know, for protective measures. And so I would encourage you to ask your kid what they what they know about these types of things. They're not going to go away. And a lot of people, you know, I have friends who work in elementary schools and they call them like bad guy drills, which just like breaks my heart. But you want them to know these things. Yeah. Gotta and have and, if, you, difficult and conversations. if you feel like they don't, know or don't have you know some of these answers or whatever then maybe that's when you contact the school to say hey what is the and that and that's totally reasonable mm -hmm. i think it's completely reasonable of a, of a parent or someone you know who's raising a school-aged child to to want to make sure that we're doing the best mm -hmm. Whew. all right only cried like twice so far yeah, so yeah. it's going pretty well we've made it we've made it through all right Yep. You want to do last episode's question? I'd love to what move was on last? To Oh, the clear the list. Okay, we're back. Yeah, yeah. Go last ahead. Last episode was clear the list. I'll Sure, I'll read our fill in the blank for that. In January 2007, <laughs> a lawsuit was filed on behalf of two families against the state of Washington for not meeting its constitutional obligation to amp amply fund a uniform system of education. By February 2010, King County Superior Court had declared the state out of compliance with Article 9 of the Washington State Constitution. The oral argument for this case was heard in front of the Washington Supreme Court on June 28, 2011. On January 5, 2012, the Washington State Supreme Court agreed with the opinion of King County Superior Court that the state was not fulfilling its obligation to fully fund education in the state. What was the name of that case and decision? And that was McCleary et al. versus the state of Washington or the McCleary decision. Hmm. Well, nice. Equitable school funding. It's kind of an interesting case. I was reading all about it in researching that episode. The so, list. Yeah. Yeah. It's just all right. funding. How we don't have it anyway. Yep. All right. This so episode's question? This one. This famous Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Parkland, it's all the same, a graduate, was once harassed in D.C. by Marjorie Taylor Greene, where she called him, quote, a coward. In reality, this Harvard student has written a New York Times bestseller and was named as one of Time's 100 Most Influential People in 2018. So who is that famous Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Parkland graduate? Okay. Who has led the charge for a bunch of the things we've talked about, yep. actually, or yep, is yep. a face for a lot of that. Continues does to. Some, does some good work. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Is yours happier or is mine happier? Because I feel like we need to really up the happy. Uh, I think uh, yours is happier. Let's end on yours. Okay, go ahead. Okay. What did you learn? What did I learn? I learned about this cosmonaut named Alexei Leonov. He drew the he made the first drawing in space, the per, first piece of like two-dimensional art in space. 
It's he did a drawing of an orbital sunrise following a spacewalk. I heard about this. I was on Twitter scrolling as I do, and I came. I follow John Green on Twitter, and he isn't. This podcast. is a John Green stand yeah, it's a podcast, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hank basically. Green. Uh, we talked about the book Anthropocene Reviewed here, but he has a podcast also called Anthropocene Reviewed, and they did an episode. He did an episode about this piece of artwork that is Alexei Leonov's drawing of an orbital sunrise, and like I said, first art created in space basically is what it's called. It's just this scribble. Basically, the all the cosmonauts they were allowed to carry like a very small personal. Well. I said all, but there were two of them. The Cosmos the, <laughs> in the program, yeah. Well, in the program, generally, they were allowed to c- carry small personal effects into space. Yeah. And this guy was an artist, and he kind of, I, I think he even maybe wanted to go to art school, but decided to become a pilot instead Same. because you can't make money in art school. Yeah, um, so he became, he became a cosmonaut. And so the thing that he decided to take to space with him was a sketch pad and a set of colored pencils. There's a cool link to it. We'll put it in the show notes, but there's the, when you look at the, picture of this set of colored pencils there's this little ring in the back of it that all the pencils are tied to so they don't go floating <laughs> off kept through. yeah so he keeps this whole thing That's like cool. strapped to his arm and the pencils all tied to the thing and then he's got this sketch pad but a part of his mission was to do a spacewalk and <laughs> i don't know how they didn't see this coming but for whatever reason this the spacesuits for the evas that the cosmos had at the time there was the, the pressure differential between space where there is you know no atmosphere yep. and the suit caused his suit to expand to the point where he could not get back in the airlock he couldn't get in the airlock of his ship that was orbiting the earth so he had to slowly let the pressure out of his suit and essentially suffocate himself inside his suit in order to smush himself like an over inflated balloon back into Did he survive <laughs> yeah he survived so he had to smush himself back into the the I'm airlock stressed. and then so he he his adrenaline was pumping and his like his fellow cosmonaut was like are you okay you should probably get some rest because we're about to try to re-enter earth's atmosphere and this guy's adrenaline is pumping because he almost died in the vacuum of space he's like nope i'm just gonna make a drawing instead so he draws at that point he oh draws gosh. this image of this orbital sunrise and it just looks like this really simplistic kind of like but it's really also beautiful when you look at it it's just this kind of rough sketch of different layers of the earth's atmosphere and the sun coming up over and you can kind of see the earth down below the ocean and some like things that are probably looking like land but it's kind of an incredible piece of art there i think there were like two or three more times when those guys almost died on this mission oh my gosh there's like they went into this free like something happened to one of their thrusters so they started spinning around when they were in orbit so they couldn't you know basically the, there's like this disco strobing effect going on because the sun is hitting the window in their cabin they're just like spinning around like crazy and then they're I think their guidance system failed, so they had to choose. This is like another thing that went wrong. Their guidance system failed, and they had to choose a, like a manual landing oh spot. Gosh, they really wanted to live. So they, see, that's what I'm talking about. I hope that kicks in for me. <laughs> I crashed, hope it does. They crashed like 1,500 miles away from their original landing site in the Siberian expanse of winter. They crashed into a tree, and the way that their capsule landed, the tree was blocking their door. So they had to rock back and forth in the capsule for like hours to get out of the capsule. And then they had to ski. (laughs) Okay. I believe this less and less as you keep talking. Russian winter. So they had to like ski until they could get airlifted. How did they have skis? Uh, Well, rescue team came to them and brought them skis, but they had to ski out away from where they crash landed their capsule. So anyway, they almost died like five different times during this mission or something but that's part of the story of why i like this drawing so much i would love to get like a print of this thing because it's just this little scribble on a sketch pad but it's so beautiful and what it represents is really cool and the fact that a cosmonaut was like you know what i really need to do i need to make art in space that's just who i am yeah i just think think it's really beautiful so anyway that was a long wow. recap of the John Green podcast oh episode. But yeah, so what did you learn? That's so cool. Mine is <laughs> It was not. a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, you sent me a tweet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you sent me a tweet that Spotify now lets you listen to podcasts at 3.5 times the speed. <laughs> and what I learned is that don't do that. That's too fast. Um, We're not meant for that sort of speed. I already talked too quickly. 
So if you speed me up at 3.5, I'm going to owe you and a lot of other people an apology. I don't even think I could listen. I can barely follow the thread at like 1.5. Like 1.5 is pretty much my max. Yeah. 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 When I'm editing, I'll speed it up to like 1.2 to get get through things sometimes. But even then I have to make it normal speed sometimes. But 3.5 sounds impossible. Don't do that. Yeah. No one is at their best at 3.5. No one. (laughs) You things... sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks at that speed, I would think. That's true. Other things, we're still watching Ted Lasso. It's great. We started The Good Wife, and it's it's really great. Yeah, Tennessee you've seen, seen it before. It. I, yeah. This is my first watch. watch um, good lawyer show. And also, like, the state of the world is just kind of right now. Sorry about that bleep. You know, there are Afghans who, who need help, and there are people in the United States who are being forced out of their homes because of floods or because of the fires. The lifting of the eviction moratorium. Or, I mean, it is just, like... It feels hopeless a lot of the time. So not that everyone has a lot of money, but there are a lot of places who are trying to help people. There are more storms on the way for the East Coast. It's just, there's a lot. So this is kind of my every other week reminder to maybe like just get off of Twitter and uh, try not to just become so consumed by that because it, it does feel hopeless at times. Mm-hmm. But that there... Yeah, do things to take care of yourself. Yeah, we were like, just talking about this. Like, I know that I can't be on social media very much especially facebook which i think is a toxic yeah heap of crap most yeah, like of the you time. can do twitter but i can't really do twitter yeah i've curated I have to go to twitter instagram, instagram for is my like own, a happy place for me yeah i've curated twitter for my own mental health pretty heavily so it's an okay place but yeah so just like you know spend less time on social media spend more time with one another doing things you love I just watch tv Honestly, find a way to a chill nice out the- find a way to take care of yourself take a nice long bath college football is about to start take Ooh, yeah. a nap Naps literally are great. do anything start a thousand piece puzzle that'll keep hug you busy. your dog get a dog get a dog get a cat I get mean, another dog there's you know this whole conversation surrounding the the vaccine and like what we're seeing in ohio is that things are spiking even for like the children's hospitals so again getting your vaccine is not going to guarantee you do not get sick but it is going to increase the odds that you will not need to be hospitalized yeah. my uh, booster is coming coming near and i'm very anxious to go get it if that's you make sure that you're planning ahead to get your booster as soon as you can that you talk to your doctor or whoever just to confirm you know what's the best route for you but so anyways don't get stuck in the suck there's a lot of suck though not that this episode is gonna like help build you out of that but welcome to the suck next episode will be something bright and cheery yeah we are talking about more fun things now yeah we're sort of sorry to be a downer on this one but we did think it was important to talk about but yeah so, we got some interesting stuff coming um, up all of the links for everything we've talked about will be in the bio go buy that book go listen to john green's podcast yep and we will see you in two weeks we'll see you then bye bye Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. I'm ready for soup.